Did you get a lot of treatment as far as your post-traumatic stress? No. No. It was all on your own and talking to other individuals that had it? Maybe I can recite a poem. Would you like to Absolutely, hear a poem? Absolutely. I would love to. Okay. This poem is called Shrinking Away. Survived the war, but was having trouble surviving the peace. Couldn't sleep more than two hours. Scared to be without a gun. Nightmares, daymares, guilt and remorse. Wanted to stay drunk all the time. 1966, and the VA said Vietnam wasn't a war. They couldn't help, but did give me a copy of the Yellow Pages. Picked a shrink off the list. 50 bucks an hour. I was making 125 a week. We spent six sessions establishing rapport. I heard about his military life, his homosexuality, his fights with his mother, and anything else he wanted to talk about. At this rate, we would have got to me in 1999. Gave up on that shrink, couldn't afford him, wasn't doing me any good. Six weeks later, my shrink killed himself. Great, not only guilt about the war, but new guilt about my dead shrink. If only I had a better job, I could have kept on seeing him. I thought we were making real progress. Maybe in another six sessions, I could have helped him. I realized then, surviving the peace was up to me. That's incredibly deep. Incredi it shows a lot of emotions. Now, what Makes made you, you cry. Yeah, that's, it's, <laughs> that's intense. What made you decide to enlist in this war? I come from a long line of warriors. Uh, my grandfather was in World War I. My uncles were all in World War II. Uh, my cousins went to Korea, and so it was just a natural thing. At the time, there was only two paths available on the reservation. You could go to reform school, state prison route, or you can go to the military. And I chose the military. Now, you wrote about your Vietnam experience and how it compared to the warrior life of your people. How do you think that relates to today's soldiers? I think the soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan are going to have the same kinds of problems that I did. Uh, being hyper alert, hyper vigilant, uh, jumping when you hear a loud noise. Or actually, I used to throw myself down on the floor when I'd hear a loud noise, a car door slamming or something. I'd throw myself down on the floor. Then I'd feel kind of sheepish after that because people are all sitting around watching me. <laughs> right. Well, I know that your son, Matthew, decided that that was something, a path that he wanted to take, and you discouraged that. Is that because of your experiences, because of what you had to go through? Yes. I have a, song, I have a poem that matches that son of mine. Uh, he joined the Army. I, I wanted him to be a Marine if you're going to do it, but he joined the Army and became an infantryman. This is called uh, Ogichida, an Ojibwe word that means warrior. I was born in war, WW2. Listened as the old men told stories of getting gassed in the trenches, WW1. Saw my uncles come back from Guadalcanal, North Africa, from the Battle of the Bulge. Memorized the war stories my cousins told of Korea. Finally, my brothers too, joined the Marines in time for the Cuban Missile Crisis. Heard the crack of rifles in the rice paddy south of Da Nang. Saw my friends die there, then tasted the bitterness of the only war America ever lost. My son is now a warrior. Will I listen to his stories or cry into his open grave? Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And you just, you sit down and you write and this all just flows out of you. Is this a hard process for you to put together or is it just natural? No, it's a... Uh, the hard part is revising and rewriting and revising so it says exactly what I want it to say. Right. That particular poem that I just read, when I originally wrote it, it was 120 lines long. And I rewrote it and it kept getting smaller and smaller. Right. I was getting rid of everything that wasn't necessary to the poem. And so now it's about 20 lines long. But it says everything I want to say. The exact point then. Now, is your son as good of a writer as you are, or is he lacking in your experience? Only when he wants money from me. <laughs> he says, Dad, I want to be a writer like you. Can I have $20 or whatever? Right. 
So is it considered an honor in your tribe to be a warrior? Yes, it is. A very high honor. They were, the people know that they wouldn't exist as a people without us because we are willing to put our lives on the line, our sanity on the line. Want to hear another poem? I would love to hear another poem. Okay. This one is called Grandma's Hair. It is really crazy at times. Once we were caught out in this big rice paddy, bad guys started shooting at us. I was close to the front of the formation, so I got inside the tree line quick. They couldn't see me anymore. When I leaned over to catch my breath, I heard the snick, snick, bang sound, someone firing a bolt action rifle, shooting at the Marines still out in a rice paddy. I could tell where he was from the sound of his rifle. Snick, snick, bang. I fired a three-round burst at the noise. That asshole turned and fired at me. I saw the muzzle flash, heard the bullet snap by at the same time. I fired another three-round burst as I moved closer. Then, through a little opening in the brush, I could see what looked like a pile of rags, bloody rags. I went over and gave him one in the head to make sure. We used to do that all the time. One in the head to make sure. When my 762 bullet hit, it knocked his hat off. When his hat came off, all his hair comes spilling out. It was a woman. She had hair like my grandma's. See, the thing that I'm really, really curious about here is that you have intense experiences with this war, going, seeing trauma, seeing um, extreme situations of things that some people will never, never see or understand. Do you regret? regret, excuse me, do you regret ever going into the war? No. No, it's part of building me who I am today. I knew it as a duty and an honor to go because it was well respected in my, on my reservation among the Anishinaabe people. So I know I fulfilled that part and surviving it and surviving the time after the war is just a bonus. So Have every you? year, every year, my reservation has a dance, a powwow, just for us, and they give us goodies like that big heavy jacket I was wearing. <laughs> they give us uh, wild rice. They give us the recognition that uh, mainstream America didn't get Vietnam veterans when they came back, but we we get it every year. Do you feel as if returning soldiers now get the recognition recognition that they deserve? No. There are, there are groups that meet uh, some troops coming back, but once they get past uh, that, that initial greeting, then they go back to their homes and their families and communities. And I, I hear a lot of them are dying because they're doing dumb things. Um, bringing a gun to a, to, a, to a party or something, and someone takes a gun away from them and shoots them. There's a lot of people that are uh, killing themselves because they can't cope with uh, the memories or the experiences that they had. So I think a lot more could be done for the returning veterans. Do you feel like you as a returning soldier got everything that you deserve from not only individuals but also from the government? Um, I was a Marine. I wasn't a soldier. Big difference. A very, a very, I understand that. <laughs> a very, very important difference. Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think I got the, the recognition. I do now because I put my stuff out there. Of course. So I, I do get that recognition now, but uh, for many years I was alone with that thought. And the only people I could really talk to were other veterans, other veterans who had been in Vietnam. Yeah. And so I think uh, the veterans coming back from uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan are going to have to find some successful paths like I did. But there was nobody to point the way for me. It was all feeling my way through. Right. Well, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. So we really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. Northrop. We'll be back in just a moment to wrap up Direction Northeast. When you drive for a living, you buckle up every time. Whether you drive one of these, are one of these. Truckers know what I'm talking about because no matter how good a driver you are, trouble can still happen. 
That's when you want to keep your safety belt on to keep you steady. Behind the wheel, in control, and looking out for everybody. Safety is a professional driver's responsibility. Remember, you're the one who drives for a living. A message from the U.S. Department of Transportation. That concludes the program for today. We met Native American writer and poet Jim Northrup. Thanks again to our guests for this program. Community is a very important part to the students at Northeast State Community College, and this program takes a look at a few of the subjects they find important. We encourage you to get out and explore the natural beauty of our region and be aware of all the issues concerning your community. Until we meet next time, on behalf of the students, staff, and faculty of Northeast State Community College, I'm Jerry Arbor, and this is Direction Northeast.